Hello and welcome back for another Torah Tuesday. We are continuing our trek through Exodus chapter 12. We've made it through all the ritual instructions and now the narrative of the death of the firstborn finally resumes. So you may remember from chapter 11 that God announced the Egyptian firstborn would die if they did not let his people go and Pharaoh refused again. And so this is finally uh, the implementation of that threat. We've had a long ritual interlude that has prepared the people of Israel for that moment so that they would be protected by God uh, when the time came for the firstborn to die. They had to show their commitment to obeying God's word. They uh, sacrificed a lamb, put the blood on their doorpost. They gathered as a family in preparation for a hasty departure from Egypt. All of this indicated that they were taking Yahweh seriously. None of it was super hard to do. They just had to have this dinner party with some of their close family uh, or neighbors so that they were ready to leave. And so what we've noticed in these past verses up until verse 28 of the chapter has been a focus on that ritual preparedness, first of the Passover, then of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is the way of annually remembering or recalling God's rescue in Egypt. So we're going to pick up the narrative now. And I'm going to begin by reading from my translation of the Hebrew. So it was in the middle of the night that Yahweh struck every firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh sitting on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the pit house and every firstborn animal. Pharaoh arose by night, he and all his servants and all Egypt, and a great cry went up in Egypt, for there was no house in which none was dead. He called for Moses and Aaron by night, and he said, Arise, leave from the midst of my people, both you and the Israelites, and go serve Yahweh as you have spoken. Take both your flocks and your herds, just as you have spoken, and go, but bless me too. And Egypt strongly urged the people to hurry, to send them away from the land, for they said, All of us are dying so the people carried their unleavened dough, their kneading troughs bound up in their garments on their shoulders. The Israelites had acted according to the word of Moses. They had asked the Egyptians for articles of silver and articles of gold and tunics. Yahweh had given the people favor in the eyes of Egypt, and they let them have what they asked for. So they stripped Egypt. So that was Exodus 12 verses 29 through 36. We see that the death of the firstborn does not just affect the elite of Egypt, but everyone, everyone from Pharaoh on down to someone in jail, uh, someone captive in a cistern. This, this um, juxtaposition reminds us of Joseph, who was thrown into a cistern by his brothers, then sold into slavery, trafficked to Egypt, and where he rose to prominence and became second in command. The full range of Joseph's experience uh, coming into Egypt is the full range of those affected by this uh, act of God in Egypt. So regardless of class, people are affected. In verse 30, we learn that a great cry went up from Egypt. This is just like the great cry in chapter 3, verses 7 through 9, that the Israelites made in Egypt because they were being oppressed. And God listened to that cry and he set them free. This cry, the cry of the Egyptians, is a direct result of that one. It's because they caused the Israelites to cry out that God brings punishment on them. So that maybe raises a question, whose cries does God hear? Does God only listen to one ethnic group when they cry out and not others? Well, it's clear from the book of Exodus, if we read the whole book, that God is not playing favorites ethnically Whoever is victimized and cries out, God will hear their cries. So it doesn't, it, it's not because they're Israelites that God's listening to them. It's because they are oppressed by the Egyptians. And so the cry of the Egyptians now is a, the cry of the oppressor. Those who have participated and been complicit in the oppression of the Israelites. And so that cry does not merit the same kind of response as the cry of Israel earlier in the book. I want to mention a verse that comes up later in Exodus when they get to Sinai that I think helps to answer that question of whose cries are heard by God. 
Exodus 22, verse 21, do not mistreat or oppress a foreigner. For you were foreigners in Egypt. Do not take advantage of the widow or the fatherless. If you do, and they cry out to me, I will certainly hear their cry. My anger will be aroused, and I will kill you with the sword. Your wives will become widows and your children fatherless. So it's clear that God takes very seriously the cries of the oppressed, even when Israel is the oppressor. And I think that's an important uh, note to make going forward as we try to understand the ways of God in the world. One question I still have is who qualifies as a firstborn? It says all of the firstborn of Egypt died. Is this the firstborn via the father or via the mother? Um, does it include only males or do female firstborn also die? Is it only children who die or do adult firstborns also die? If adult firstborn die, then why is Pharaoh still alive at the end of this story? Because he certainly would have been the firstborn of his father. That That's how normally royal succession worked in Egypt. I'm not sure the text doesn't specify all the details of that. All we see is that this is widespread, the destruction is widespread, and that every house is affected by it. Verses 31 and 32 are where Pharaoh summons Moses and Aaron. Uh, now they're not seeking an audience with him. He's seeking an audience with them, which shows the tables have been turned. Uh, he's humiliated and he's finally compliant. He's finally going to say all of the things they've been waiting for him to say. He speaks in the plural, y'all get up and go. Um, it's not just, this is not just an escape for Moses and Aaron, but for all the Israelites, he acknowledges the purpose for them leaving. He says, serve Yahweh as you've spoken. I know that's what, why you're wanting to leave is to serve Yahweh. He recognizes here that although they've been serving him, Yahweh is the one with the true claim on them and he's releasing them for Yahweh's service. He tells them they can take their flocks and their herds when they go, which is the that last thing he was holding out on uh, before. He even refers to them as the sons of Israel for the first time in this little speech, which is acknowledging them as a national entity uh, rather than just as individuals. So this is a fulfillment of chapter 3, verse 20, and chapter 6, verse 1, where God says that, he, that Pharaoh is going to drive them out. He's going to compel them to leave. What's most fascinating about Pharaoh's statement here is that he ends with, bless me too, which is a recognition that the tables have turned and that they have conquered him. As it says in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 7, without doubt, the lesser is blessed by the greater. So for Pharaoh to be requesting a blessing acknowledges that Moses and Aaron and the God they serve are superior to him and he stands in need of their blessing. Unwittingly, he is participating here in God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12 verses 1 through 3, which, which announced that through the family of Abraham, all nations would be blessed. So we can see a, an unwitting alignment with that passage here. In verses 33 to 34, we find out how the rest of the Egyptians feel about this arrangement. They are on board with the Exodus. Uh, verse 34 explains why the Feast of Unleavened Bread ends up being a thing, because the people are midway through preparing their daily meal when everybody urges them to leave, and they want them to leave right away because they don't know what's going to happen next. If they don't let them go, will more family members die? And so they they rush them out of Egypt and the bread has not had time to rise or be baked. And this becomes the foundation for the future celebration of the Feast of Unleavened Bread in conjunction with the Passover. Verses 35 and 36 talk about the plunder that these neighbors give to the Israelites. Uh, normally, wealth is taken after a battle. So you, you fight someone and then you get their wealth. And here, although the Israelites themselves have not fought, what they receive is kind of like plunder. In chapter 3, verse 22 and 11, verse 2, God has announced to the Israelites that they are to ask their neighbors for this wealth. And it's interesting to note that in Deuteronomy, chapter 15, verses 13 through 15, there are laws for an Israelite master 
who has an indentured servant working for him, and the time has uh, been fulfilled, the time of labor that they owed the master has been fulfilled, and they send them away. This would be after a six-year period of service, no more than that. Um, the masters must release their servants with generous gifts. That might, that might reflect what we see going on here, uh, that after a period of service, you should be properly paid. You should be thanked for your service. You should receive generously from your master. And so this is what happens with the Israelites. This uh, wealth that they have is used in various ways going forward. Some of these uses are not so good and others are very positive. The golden calf episode obviously uses some of this gold and silver in illicit ways. And yet when they build the tabernacle, they have all the resources that they need to do so, which probably uh, could be traced back to this moment where the neighbors are generous. No doubt they want to also be on the good side of these people who have a God fighting on their behalf. They want the Israelites to leave with a sense of goodwill and so they're generous to them. So that brings us to the end of the actual, um, the, the moment of departure from Egypt. The rest of the chapter is going to kind of unfold for us how those first few days went and give us some extra instructions as well. Um, some addendums to the Passover instructions. So we'll tackle that next week. Have a great week. Mm -hmm.